What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of At Home with Mark. Um, super, super special episode for season four, episode three. Coming straight from my alma mater, Mr. Sean McMahon, who's the, the chair of the film screen department at Berkeley. Sean, thanks for making time, man. I know it's busy with the start of the term right now. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's a real honor and privilege to be here with you today. Yeah, man. I'm looking forward to it. And I brought this out to show you. I know we did a, a webinar for Berkeley was that a couple was that a couple months ago how long that was a, it was in the fall ago? yeah okay. something like that well we talked about this and i told you i had oh my this. goodness on vinyl so, yeah man so my parents had i don't know they had this and then they had like i loved the music man growing up that was like my favorite musical like my watch that with my mom um and i just loved the music in that so they had that on vinyl they had like Bye Bye Birdie and all these old like, you know, 70s, 60s kind of musical stuff. But like this is a prized possession in my collection on my vinyl upstairs. Um, but that was I'm like, in, thing, right? That was my <laughs> thing that that sort of for me, you know, I, I ended up getting into film scoring through through Berkeley. Um, but I, I think what what was interesting for me, you know, that I think that film came out the year I was born, 1978. And uh, um, I just saw it over and over in the 80s as a kid. Uh, I was on TV a lot. I didn't see it in the theaters, but it was on all the time. And um, the I remember flying around in the kitchen, you know, when I was five, you know, singing S Superman and um, the theme, of course, which is um, unmistakable and just, you know, a classic. And uh, and then when I got to Berkeley, you know, 20 years later or, or you know, 19 years later, um, actually, what, 15 years later, um, you know, that 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 sort of love for film music was was latent. Uh, it was sort of dormant inside me. And then it was able to sort of flourish when, once I got to Berkeley, because I didn't under I think like many folks um, who are just, you know, and regular people who are consuming entertainment. You know, most people don't watch a movie and say, hey, someone actually had to write the music to that. You know, right. and then, um, and so, uh, so, so for me, you know, I took this uh, class called Introduction to Film Scoring, and I just sort of connected that uh, with, you know, my my childhood, and I had all these warm and fuzzy memories <laughs> from the, you know, growing up in the '80s um, in suburban Canada, and um, it, it was, um, you know, I haven't haven't looked back uh, since. You know, it's really been a great. Um, you know, career path for me and for many others. Yeah. So what, if we go way back, like what is your earliest musical memory? Oh gosh, that's hard. You know, I, I mean, my, I mean, technically it would be starting violin. Um, my mom was not really a musician, but she loved classical music. She, she dabbled with guitar a little bit, but her, um, uh, she, you know, like, I don't know what would happen to her if she had to go a day without listening to Mozart. You know, classical music was like always on, uh, you know, when she was getting ready for work in the morning, we had a radio in the bathroom and she'd be, uh, you know, at seven in the morning, you know, putting her makeup on and, and you know, hearing classical music. And it was just sort of ubiquitous in the car. You know, we were, you know, we had to listen to her station, the classical station. We couldn't put it on the rock station. When Anyway, um, so when I was four, um, she handed me a violin and we went off for violin lessons. And, um, and, and I, um, that's sort of my first memory of it. Uh, I remember being very excited about it. You know, it was, it was new and this novel thing. And then, you know, after about six months, I'm like, no, I don't really, <laughs> this is kind of a drag, you know, <clears throat> um, later on, I would beg my mom for a guitar and, uh, you know, th th I, I started to pursue music um, in a way that I wanted to do that, which was frankly rock and roll, playing in bands. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, but starting out, I um, uh, I started out on a quarter size violin um, at the uh, taking, uh, Royal, in, in Canada, we have this uh, thing called the Royal Conservatory of Music. It's, it's sort of like, uh, sort of a standardized, um, you know, uh, music school and uh, so I started when I was four quite young and um, yeah I, I remember learning how to hold a bow uh, how to hold a violin um, how to, learning how to read music and 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 I realized I had some talent for it because I would hear stuff on the radio and I'd be able to um, to kind of just play along by ear hmm. and I remember my dad being kind of like really wowed by that because my dad is also not a musician at all 
and 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 I think for non musicians like my parents, music can be this. It's like this mystical thing. It's like where does it come from? How do you write music? Where do you, it, it's like so abstract and mysterious. Uh, and just to go on a quick tangent, you know, I'm, I'm involved in film music, and I think before the advent of the sequencer, before compute uh, composers were writing music in um, computers, which you know predates my time in the industry. But from what I've heard from you know more senior composers, they'd say back in the day there was this sort of um, halo effect composers had. They would walk into a room with studio executives or whoever, and there was just this sense of awe. <laughs> like how do you do it? Where does like how like it was just such the kind of mind blowing thing? Like how do you write music? Where does it come from? You know, um, you know, with with like, let's say a, a painter, it, it's a little bit you know the a average person can kind of figure that out a lot quicker. Well, you got different color paints, you got a toothbrush. I mean, a toothbrush. You have a you have a paintbrush. You have a canvas, but like music just kind of comes out of nowhere. So, so mm -hmm. it was. Um, so now that's to kind of close the loop on that that's kind of that's changed a lot now because in fact it's kind of gone the other way when um you know you have a, a maybe a, a movie producer's uh son or daughter making music you know there might be 11 making music on garage band on their mac you know and and they might say to a composer he wants maybe hundreds of thousands how hundreds of thousands of dollars as a fee to score a movie what you want that kind of money like you know my kid can write music on the laptop you know and so so there's that now right so we've kind of the, the pendulum has swung i know it's it's such a double-edged sword too because like there's things that are beautiful about what we have access to these days and then there's things that are just like it feels like it gets a little bit watered down or it's so saturated that it takes away the meaning and the the weight of things like you're saying in a way i mean it i don't know i mean for what you do I mean, I only, so when I was in my first undergrad outside of Berkeley, I took a composition class and that was like 2000, it might've been 2001 when I did that. And that was the first time I ever got exposed to finale, like using finale. And I can remember being like, whoa, this is like such a game changer. Cause I hear all this stuff in my head, but I don't know how to get it out. And I don't know what instruments, like, you know, how I write for this specific instrument if I'm writing a string quartet. Like, how do I notate it? But now it's, I can do it by ear and kind of figure it out. And then that teaches me which clef goes with what instrument and how that is interpreted. So it's like the advance of, of that stuff happening opened up doors for people like me who didn't ever notate by hand or anything. Like I never would have been able to do that because I just, A, I'm not good at math. So <laughs> like yeah. writing, I can play complicated rhythms and hear complicated rhythms and stuff in my head, but to like, have a have finale kind of coach you almost through how that stuff works it's pretty amazing but now everybody can just do it you know um yes yeah, definitely created more access um and and let's face it there are there are composers now very talented people who who have careers who can have careers without having to um you know go to college and and, and study music on a very formal basis so it's it's um the the bar for entry to get into like film scoring is is much lower now anyone anyone can do it um but um obviously i'm i'm biased i i graduated from berkeley's film scoring program and now i'm the chair of it but uh i i think when you go to college for something like film scoring you um you, you know you you're you're giving yourself the edge it's very competitive and i think those four years it's also a lot of money to study but uh you know th probably puts gives you an advantage compared to 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 other folks but yeah i definitely get what you're saying especially when you, you when you make the parallel that you know i'm not good at math or i don't like math i mean that's exactly how many students see it they see theory like math you know mm -hmm. and so 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 i actually you know when i can so de depending on the, this context or the circumstance don't don't use the word theory because students just hear math they hear like yeah trigonometry and algebra uh and so uh but uh yeah I, uh, your your point is well taken yeah it's my buddy sage is in here he was asking uh he said ask him if he knows the story behind the score for once upon a time in the west um and then he says right after that this is the only movie in the history of film that was directed to the score wrote the music for the um, script. <clears throat> 
So they're, you know they're the cutting behind that. I, I I don't. I mean, so if um, you know they want to, to fill me in, pl please feel free to do it. I, I I do know a few things about. Um, so I, I think he's talking about the 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 film being cut to the music, right? So it's the thing in, in, in film scoring is that we we serve the picture as composers. And um, you would never say to the picture editor, you know what, you know, I've got this great thing going with my music, you know, it's, I've got this groove and I wanna, I wanna synchronize right on the downbeat of bar 17 and that helicopter explosion it's just a little bit too early. Could you push it? <laughs> could you push it back a little bit so it lands right on? So I don't have to change my tempo. I don't have to change my meter. Or anything. Okay, that would obviously never happen, right? The, the 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 film editor is you know the composer is in service to the film. Um, we jump through hoops to align it just right, and we have to make it musical. You know, if imagine just taking a beat out of a song, a, you know, random song, there would be a hiccup, right? There would not be musical. That would not be musical. So what we need to do is is find a sort of a musical solution uh, to this. But but in terms of anecdotes, I, I can regale you with with one that I recall. It's from uh, E.T. Uh, you may know it, the John Williams uh, score for the which he won the Academy Award for. Um, that came out in what eighty one or eighty two. Um, that is probably the if for those of if there's anyone interested in learning like just how to score a film or just, just how does how does a film come together how is it all organized right um there's an organization to almost all films uh, that's probably the best one to study because the themes are so clear clearly laid out right there's a theme for the mothership and then there's a theme for you know et and the elliot bonding and so on and so forth but um but the uh, that was scored in the early 80s. And this is before we had sequencers, before Cubase, Digital Performer, Logic, Pro Tools. So the way that the film composer would um, synchronize the music um, with, with, the, with the picture is by visual cues. So, um, so John Williams, that was recorded at uh, the, the Sony stage in, in Culver City. And... Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can watch, um, you can, you can sort of search for this. There are some documentaries on it um, where, you know, the movie is projected on, it's a big movie screen on the back of the recording studio. And John Williams is there with like a hundred piece orchestra, Steven Spielberg's in the booth. And there are these visual markings, right? So you'll see like a flash, like just like a, like a hole punch through a, a frame of film. That's, that's called a punch. And, and you can use a punch for a few different things. Um, uh, someone named a music editor, depending on the tempo of the piece, this is back when we were using film, right? Everything's digital now, but would cut a hole, would punch a hole um, and on, on every beat or on, not on every bar, or every two bars. So the conductor knows, you know, where he or she is in, in the piece. And so you see this little flash, right? Hmm. And, um, and then maybe when you have a big point of emphasis, a big, what's called a sync point where you're synchronizing you know, some, some sort of visual emphasis on the screen with a musical emphasis. So maybe, you know, maybe the helicopter explodes and then you have a big downbeat, you know, big start of a new phrase uh, there. Um, uh, what was I saying? So, uh, sorry, I lost my, my uh, uh, train of thought. Oh, so, so yeah. So, so, and then now if that sounds hard to do. It is. It's actually quite a quite a difficult thing to do, and sequ sequencers have now solved that for the film composer, where everything is kind of clicked out. Um, but the, if you watch the end of uh, ET, from when the when when the when the boys steal ET and try to get ET to the mothership, that's like a whole fifteen minute sequence. Very hard, very dense, difficult orchestral music, and John Williams just wasn't. He wasn't getting all the sync points. It was really difficult, and he just he couldn't do it. And I was watching this interview on YouTube, and I was sort of surprised to hear that because you think John Williams can do anything, right? Right. And so, so then Steven Spielberg makes this offer to him, which is highly it was unusual back then, and it's unusual today. He said, "Listen, we know that the music that you wrote roughly fits the music. You know, it's it's all timed out." why don't you just focus on getting the best 
take from the orchestra, the best or performance from them. And I will recut the movie to your, your, the, the best musical take. Whoa. So that's what they did. And it, that probably has never happened for John Williams ever since and probably hasn't really happened for anybody. And so um, it's, it's like the way you make like a music video. You know, the music exists first and then you sort of cut the video to that. Uh, I think with a lot of trailers, the music exists first and then you, you cut the trailer to the track. So it was kind of like, like a music video approach. <laughs> and, um, and so that's why John Williams, now if you watch the end of that, <clears throat> that movie, I mean, it's hard to like sort of not tear up at the end. It's like there's, it's so mm -hmm. sort of emotional there, right? We, we know when ET when ET leaves and 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 the the mom sort of collapses and and if you know, it, it's it's a great piece of cinema if, if nothing else. But John Williams sort of um, credits the, what he calls like an operatic sense of satisfaction of emotional emotional satisfaction, which is kind of what we want to do as artists, right? We want people to feel things. And he sort of credits that with the fact that Steven Spielberg gave him that opportunity to just focus on the music. Don't worry about syncing, you know, hitting this sync point, hitting that sync point. Um, and and I, I would happen to agree. I mean, I think something that I've really, not to sort of sound like a Luddite or anything. I mean, you know, we know technology is here. It's here to stay. And it's only going to become more woven into our lives and to all sorts of media and entertainment. But um you know, these days when a composer is recording in the studio, everything is click, clicked out, right? So everything has a click track. All the studio, um, all the musicians are all wearing headphones in the studio and they're hearing click, 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 click. And there's something that kind of sounds not so human about that. If mm -hmm. you listen to scores like E.T. or like the original Star Wars, it's very nuanced, by the way. So it's not like it's this hugely obvious thing, but... Um, something I've noticed, and, and I think other composers would agree, um, there's sort of this sort of musical ebb and flow to sort of older scores that, that we don't hear anymore. Everything is largely married to the the, the click now. And so we've, we've lost, so it's a trade-off, right? With technology, um, it, it's, yes, it solves problems for us, but, you know, there's sort of a cost to everything, and there's a bit of a trade-off there as well. So um, anyway, th yeah. that is my sort of ET uh, ET anecdote. I mean, I'll never forget being a kid and seeing them take off on the bikes and hearing the do 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 like that was like I was like whoa like the the way that the music and the film kind of came together. I have to go back and watch it now, knowing that because that's amazing. But like even thinking about bringing myself back to when I was a kid and seeing that movie, because I mean, it's like what we always talk about. It, it, without music in movies, it would be the dullest experience, like known to man. But what's cool, I think, about this and what you were just talking about, I find it funny. Do you ever notice that when you're dealing with an orchestra, do like orchestral players struggle with staying on the grid because they're so used to that rubato taffy like nature of playing within an orchestra, like where you can push and pull yeah. the tempo? And you know what I mean? Like it, it seems to me like a lot of orchestral. Uh, players when they sit down would, would struggle playing on a grid to a click. Yeah, I, I, they don't like it. That that's for sure. Mm. Um, they mm. often when you're recording these days, you're recording with the composer's stem, so so pre-recorded synthesized instruments. They definitely don't like that. Like, what if you have like London's best or out Los Angeles's best musicians? You know, they don't want to hear your samples. You know what I mean? Mm. They're they're there to replace that stuff. You know, uh, but occasionally you do need to let them hear that if they need to blend with, if it's a small group and they need to blend or, or if there's some intonation issues, you know, um, but um, they, they, I think they much prefer, I mean, think about just like making music. Like when you made music in your first band, you know, did you, did you put on the metronome and say, Hey guys, let's play like you just, <laughs> no. you just made music, right. With, and there's sort of a natural ebb and flow. My, my own experience, I can't speak for others, but my own experience is that, you know, musicians sort of pre prefer that, but the the or orchestral musicians prefer that. They prefer the sort of natural ebb and flow without the cans, as we say, without the headphones. But um, they understand it's a different job. You know, recording recording is different than like a, a live performance at Disney Hall or something like that. So they understand it's different. Um, they they will also rarely rarely look at you. So I've had these. You know, being a conductor in LA is sort of this 
uh, film scoring conductors, it's sort of a strange experience because you're hired there and then you, you're flapping your arms. You're not making any sound. It's not really contributing to the sound or you're not at all contributing, contributing to the soundtrack in, in that way, like, like a violinist would be. But you're doing this performance and nobody's really looking at you. The occasional time to look up. Uh, that's because I find, you know, oftentimes the musicians don't really need you. As a, as a conductor. First of all, they can't really afford to watch it because they're looking at the music for the very first time. They've never seen the music before. Now, if you're, you know, you're going to, uh, I don't know, some sort of Christmas concert and they're playing the Nutcracker, you know, whatever, like that, yeah, those players, they can do that in their sleep, um, right? So they can, they can afford to like look at the conductor as much as possible, not really even look at the music, but it's the opposite with a film score where... <clears throat> They're sight reading. They've never seen the music before. A lot of film music can be fast, dense, difficult music. Uh, and so they're kind of watching you from the periphery. Um, they also don't need you for the beat, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're getting the click, um, you know, in, in their headphones. And so um, so, so the, they, if, if there's a fermata at the end, which is, you know, I don't know if everyone of your listeners knows, knows what that is, but it's like a hold, right? You just sort of hold the note at the end, you let it ring out for as long as you can until the conductor cuts it off. Then, you know, then they kind of look up for that, right? Okay, when are you going to cut us off, right? And they'll cut <laughs> you off. But um, oftentimes you can find, you can feel sort of like useless. But I've, I've found where the real, what a composer, when you're sort of hired as a conductor to conduct a film score, uh, where the conductor really brings value is being uh, like an assistant or, or, uh, or an asset to the composer. So if, if you can imagine um, uh, having a hundred people show up to, to play your music is exhilarating. There's nothing like it. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Um, and I think that's why we, why I've continued with film scoring is because you get that feeling and then so you, you, you want it, you want another hit right away. <laughs> you know, when can yeah. I do this again? Um, but, um, uh, but it's also extremely stressful. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like your wedding day. Um, everyone's there for you. All eyes are on you. It's really awesome that everyone's come from all over the country for you. But also, if some, if if your, you know, drunk uncle gets the live microphone and starts, <laughs> you know, then it's really stressful. And it, it's kind of like that for for a composer, where yes, it's amazing. Everyone's there for you. Going to be playing your music, but. You have you're working you're you're working. There's a director there giving you directions, giving you instructions, and um, and and uh, it, it's a very much a public performance. You know, we think that composers don't perform, right? We can oh we we can just be in solitude with our machines, you know. But but really, when you go to the scoring stage, it is a public performance. You have to know you have to be very good with people, how to handle a director in front of the orchestra, and there's a lot of pressure. And I think where conductors can be of most value is is being that ally to the to the composer. So the director might say, you know what, this is just not working. In fact, it's not appropriate at all. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> it just happened. And <sighs> and uh, yeah, they can be. I mean, most direct. I mean, I've got a lot of respect for directors. It's much harder to make a movie than it is to write music, in my opinion. But sometimes, you know, and and they can be really lovely people. Sometimes they can be brutal, brutal and blunt. And so, so when you're ha having to make this change in front of an audience, basically in front of your boss, but in front of all these musicians, that can be so stressful. And um, a conductor can really be helpful in, um, in sort of just just being, you know, calm. Um, mm. Of course, because it's not the con it's not the con the conductor doesn't have a lot of pressure on their shoulders. It's it's not the conductor's name on the movie. It's the composer's name. And so, you know, they can be really think clearly and help the composer come up with quick solutions, like on the spot. Um, and, and there are lots of bits of film scores that are sort of rewritten on the spot to meet the uh, feedback of a director. Interesting. Interesting. How long does it take uh, usually? Like if you think about a show like The Mandalorian, for instance, uh, versus one of the newer Star Wars movies that's come out in the past five years, how long... Are those sessions is it like is it like a week-long session where they go in for five days and they record all the music and they're done or is it does it take longer than that when you well, finally on, on have a, the music done? yeah on, on a movie like star wars it's, it's probably going to be 
you know, three to six days, you know, maybe a better part of a week. Um, on a movie I worked on, Spider-Man 3, which came out in 2007. It's one of the older, you know, the ones with Tobey Maguire and Kirsten Dunst. We, we were recording over um, several weeks. I mean, but it wasn't like several weeks long. It was like three days this week, two days this week. Three. It was a very long process. Very, very unusual. Mm -hmm. But um, but most most of them are like very, you know, consolidated and, and, and targeted. Uh, a composer. So let's say you have a two hour movie. And 90 minutes of that has score in it, right? So you've got to record 90 minutes of music for a movie that's about two hours long. Um, most com composers, um, professional composers in LA can, can record about three to four minutes of music per hour. So you, you can do, you do the math on that. And then it's, so it does take, you know, several hours, so, you know, multiple days, three to five, three days, five days, six days. Um, yeah. <clears throat> But on a um, on on a a TV show like like The Mandalorian, it's it's actually a much more brutal schedule, and that's really, really the biggest difference between TV and film. Film, you get you get some time. You might get you may only get six weeks, but maybe you get twelve weeks to write a score. Um, where on, on a on just on a show like let's say it's an hour show, it comes out every week. And you need to produce 45 minutes. You need to record 45 minutes of music every week. Um, well, you do you do the math on that. How and how many minutes a day is that? You know that's that's a lot. Um, and so um, so the the basically the, the process is the same, but you just kind of do it on the on a weekly schedule as opposed to like several months. Um, but for a TV composer, you know they really need to have their act together, need to write very fast. Often they have teams of composers because they just can't write everything themselves. Um, and, and it's the schedule is, you know, grueling. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think that's where a lot of the, the, a lot of great opportunities are with episodic TV now, especially as Netflix and YouTube and Amazon prime, they're all creating their own show, like episodic TV shows now, you know, um, yeah. but um uh, I forget what I was going to say, but uh, yeah, th so there's lots of opportunities for, for composers with, with uh, TV these days, but yeah. Oh yeah. Back to the, um, uh, rec well, yeah, back to, to the differences. Um, it's, it's pretty, it can be pretty, pretty grueling. Um, you know, the, the schedule of a TV composer. Yeah. It's it, man. I, <laughs> I think, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but my wife and I were going back and like trying to like, quiz each other on singing like do you remember the who's the boss theme or do you remember family ties or can you sing growing pains like right now off the top of your head and we were pretty good at it and then i was like going back revisiting some of that stuff and thinking about like family ties for instance i was like man why has nobody gone back and sampled the even the intro like that funky intro of family ties like it's so good there's so many i feel like that was like the golden era of of theme songs for tv and maybe that's because, you know, because I am I was born in 79, so we're very close in age. But mm -hmm. I fondly remember that stuff, like it's watching those shows and hearing those themes every week. And uh, and even though, you know, that's what I really liked about. Did you watch? Have you watched all the Marvel like TV shows and stuff? Have you watched? No, all I haven't watched all. I've watched a bunch of the movies, but but no, not all the okay. TV shows. Because when they did WandaVision, that TV show yeah. on Disney Plus, every intro was like pretty much based on our childhood TV themes. And they did oh, like- yeah, I've heard about that. And, and you know, it's interesting oh. we because we were just talking about, well, TV, I guess we're still talking about TV. Um, uh, so so Chris Beck, Christoph Beck uh, is the composer for, for that. And um, he got his start um, in in TV. So he, he, the sort of first series, as far as I can tell that kind of, gave him some some fame in the industry was scoring Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Right. Oh, wow. And so so he had to crank out music every week for several seasons. And then he decided um, maybe when that series ended, at one point he said, okay, I'm not doing because you you get pigeonholed in in Hollywood pretty quickly, right? So so he didn't want to be like now now the thing is in terms of prestige, feature films has always been at the top and TV has been second or you know, maybe games is getting more prestigious now. So the goal for everybody, for most composers was to get into feature film. Um, I, ironically, there's more money in TV, 
but um, it was always to get into feature film, right? There's actually a saying in Hollywood. I, I, I score TV to feed my film habit, <laughs> you know, which, <laughs> right. Which means like TV is where the money is, but what I really want to be doing is film, but there's no money in film. So I got to score TV. So then I can afford mm -hmm. to, to basically not earn money for a while while I score a film. Um, <laughs> So he he decided that he wanted to um, not not be the TV composer anymore, but be the feature film comp composer. So he just completed completely stopped scoring TV, um, and it worked. He he pretty quickly was scoring like a movie called Under the Tuscan Sun with Diane uh, forget her last name uh, Diane Lane. Um, uh, what else did he do? Uh, Electra with Ben Affleck, I think. Anyway, oh, right. but he was doing. 12 movies a year like at one point that's like one a month that is insane that you know most Crazy. like famous composers like an alan silvestri or a john williams or a you know james newton howard they'll do three movies a year maybe four you know that that's sort of it but he was doing like double digits and i think the only way that he could have done that is because he honed his craft in during his tv days of so just being able to crank out music week, week after week so he's able to, to do that with um uh, with with uh, film as as well, um, so yeah, I, I love. So let's go back really quick. I just want to go back in time really quick because you you spent time in L.A. and everything. But like, at, so when you're a kid and you're playing the violin and everything, and you and when you said, ah, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. This is kind of a bummer. Yeah. So like, did you play? Like, were you playing in rock bands and stuff when you were a kid too? Yeah, I I got my first guitar when I was twelve. And, um, you, you know, I, I, my, my mom had, she played classical guitar. So we had one around and I sort of figured out how to teach myself some chords. And then, um, we, we were on vacation one day and then I, I saw this, a black Washburn electric guitar and I was like, mom, I gotta have this. And so she, she bought it for me. And, um, and then, and then, yeah, my, I started playing in, in bands when I was like 12, you know, just like, I don't know. It, it was just kind of this fun thing to do. We, we, you know, go to someone's basement and, you know, order pizza and like, it was just fun, fun way to hang out. And then, um, by the time we were 14, I, I were playing some clubs, uh, in, in Toronto. So we, we got a, I, I got a, a sort of taste of that. And then, and then that sort of continued all throughout, throughout high school. And, and that's where I got my, um, interest in, in going to Berkeley because, uh, you know, when it came time to figure out college, like I, you know, in Canada, we didn't have anything like Berkeley, right? It was like go to school for like classical music and then become like a high school band teacher. And I just, I didn't want to do that. And um, and so I had my, my brother also played, my older brother also played guitar and he collected Guitar World and Guitar for the Practicing Musician magazines. I don't know if you ever, you remember those? Oh and we just God, had yeah. like a stack. I mean, now we just live for those things, man. I mean, those were, yeah. I just love those, you know, with the, um, and that's um, how I learned how to read tab probably tab. Is those magazines, you know tab. what I mean? Like it was, and, and they were done so well. I mean, that was hard. I mean, I don't know if you know who, what was his name? Uh, Wolf Marshall who transcribed all this. Stuff. Anyway, it's like, I just like, now that I'm sort of a professional musician, I look back and think, man, whoever was transcribing that stuff was like, had a really killer ear. But anyway, um, and so I saw an ad for for Berkeley, and and I just I had heard about Berkeley like Steve Vai, right? One of my heroes went to Berkeley, and like kept on hearing about Berkeley, and then um, I, I was uh, uh, so so then I I went to Berkeley thinking that I was going to become a rock star, right? Uh -huh. uh, right. I mean, like and I, I'm probably not the only one to do that. Um, no. And and actually, when I was there, uh, and you did you go to Berkeley, Mark? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Okay. So we, we, we may have, we're around the same age, but we may not have gone at the same time. Right. So, so here's um, the difference. I went, I went when I was 28. So Berkeley is my second undergrad degree. Okay. And I so went, we, we probably, yeah. Yeah. I, I went in the era of, I wasn't expecting to be a rock star. I just wanted to learn what can I do in the songwriting industry to make money. <laughs> That's why I yeah. went to Berkeley. So I had a, I had a clearer vision than when I would have had it when I was 18. Right. Right. So. Cause when you're 19, it's like, I want to be a rock star, you know, and it's uh -huh. the only Rockstar school and and uh, I think that th that probably continues to a certain degree now, especially because of American Idol. You know, we have a lot more singers now who, you know, I, I think that sort of influenced American Idol, sort of influenced the next generation of singers. But um, so 
yeah, so I went to 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 Berkeley, and um, it was, uh, and then I sort of figured out that it was not, you know, going to work out in the in the um, way I thought it was. I, I um, started to get a little bit more practical once I got there, and then I was I was wondering like how how am I going to do I need a degree to be a rock star? And then, um, and I thought, you know, you hear, hear about all these bands that meet there, right? Like I think Dream Theater met there. And I think Aerosmith, while not being a Berkeley band per se, they met in Boston and a couple of them went to Berkeley. And you just hear about all these, you know, they, they, they found, I thought I was going to meet my musical soulmates at Berkeley and we we're going to sign a record deal and that didn't happen. Um, uh, but uh, but then but then it was also I don't know if this happened to you Mark but like it was really mind opening you know because you're just there like I just was all I really cared about was like Led Zeppelin and you know Def Leppard and you know and then you get, you know then then this whole world opens up wow you can do music there's like music therapy who thought about that or there's you know so so that was really open you know it's kind of opened my mind and then you know like I said then I took this class in film scoring and I sort of connected it to my that sort of those warm and fuzzy feelings I had as a kid, you know, watching Superman and star Wars, you know, and, and so, so it's, it's, uh, it's been a good path, not, not an easy path, you know, and, and I think um, you, you know, to really succeed in, in anything in music or anything in the arts, you really, um, you have to do it because you can't do anything else. Not, not because you can't do anything else, but because um, you have to do it, you know? Right. And, and there's this like, you know, like I, I feel that in a way you don't choose music, music chooses you, you know? So I'm, cause sometimes like, I think this, like now it's, you know, I'm in my forties and um, you know, I've got a family, I've got a mortgage, I've got like, I've got all that, you know, that kind of thing. But you know, when I was in my twenties, um, I, I uh, you know, graduated from Berkeley I moved to LA. I went, I went to USC for film music. And then, you know, I'm, I'm like in this industry that it's like, doesn't really pay well. It's really hard, really competitive. Meanwhile, my friends back home are like bankers, you know, and they're, they're like buying houses at 25 and they're can afford these really nice weddings, you know, before they're 30, you know, and then, and then, so I'm like, gosh, I just, you know, chose this profession. That's like, it's going to make having those things that they have much harder for me. But, but then, then I would start to feel better when, this was years later, I sort of come to the realization, you know, I couldn't do anything else. Not, not because I wouldn't be good as a banker or insurance or whatever, but like it chose me, you know, it, it was something mm -hmm. that chose me. So um, that has helped me, you know, <laughs> psychologically uh, because it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's not, not a sort of linear path as a, as, as a musician, right? There are these zigs and zags, you know, totally, man. you have to totally. take in your career. Did I tell you last time we talked, did I tell you that whole anecdote about my one guitar teacher, how he told me like within the first couple of weeks of taking lessons with him, he was like, so you've chosen a vow of poverty. <laughs> the musician. And I was like, what dude, I'm in middle school. What are you talking? I mean, <laughs> Come on, man. But like, it is interesting because it's like, like you were saying, not, not that you can't do anything else, but you won't settle for less in your life. Yeah. And I you only get one shot at life, is. right? You only get this one shot here. Right. As far as we know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so and, and, you know, for me as, a, as an educator, it's a it's a difficult sort of line to straddle or, or to, to sort of you have got to sort of thread this needle with the students because you want you want to. Um, yes, we're technically academics at Berkeley, but many of the faculty are industry practitioners. We're still industry practitioners. And that's why students come to Berkeley because the faculty are doing the things that the students want to do. But, but so we, we, we've spent time in the real world. We know it's hard and we don't want to sort of sugarcoat it. We want the students to expect that it's going to be hard. But at the same time, um, you can really demoralize. They've already committed you know, in a way. I mean, they're already at Berkeley. They've already sacrificed so much. Many of them come halfway around the world to be at Berkeley. Many of them are going into debt <clears throat> to finance their education. And, you know, you, you, <laughs> well, yeah, and you don't want to, and you don't want to say like, you know, you, you've, you've, you've chosen poorly, you know, right. uh, kind of like at the end of, um, 
the, the third Indiana Jones movie where, uh, do you remember, oh, what's it called? Uh, the Last Crusade, where, uh -huh. where, the, where they're not, you know, they're, they're looking for the, um, you know, the, the chalice and then, and then the, the Nazi. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. He drinks the, he drinks <laughs> he the water. Cool. Yeah. And then he just disintegrates into a skeleton. And then, and then the, the, like the, the guard there says, yeah, you, you chose poorly. You, you don't want to tell them, <laughs> you know, you don't tell students that, you know, they've already yeah. too committed. And so, so th that's been a challenging thing for me as a, an educator and a teacher is to inspire them because they're going to have to, you're going to have to be optimistic. Like if you're going to succeed, like if you think it's not going to work out, it's, it's really not going to work out. Like if you're just like, oh, I just failed. Here's another door that's closed. They were right. Like if you're not optimistic, then there's just, you're not going to have that like sort of drive to kind of push through those low times. And um, and I, I remember I did kind of a, a foolish thing some some years ago. I, uh, I, 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 um, I, I read this book on film scoring. It came with a C, like a DVD and had interviews of composers. <clears throat> and I just had this kind of like, kind of on a whim, I'm like, I wanna change my today's lesson up. And, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll play some footage from this DVD of these composer interviews. And I watched a little bit and it was okay, you know? And I don't know what, why I did this, but I did it. So I played the DVD and it was so depressing. The <laughs> like, I, I don't know why, like, like the narrative, was like get like the, you had ostensibly successful or successful composers, right? Who were all saying how hard this industry is and how much it sucks, and I, and then I felt like I'm like okay, can I bail on this right now? Like should I? Yeah. Like it, that might look bad. Like I didn't actually watch it through to the end before playing it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I didn't. But I watched some of it. Um, I thought it was going to be good, and and it was like and so then I felt I like so we had the light I had the lights off. It was like an hour video or something. And I was feeling really depressed. Like, like maybe I made a mistake getting into film scoring. And then I turned the lights on and I looked at all the students and they were completely def deflated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was just so, and, and you know, in, in retrospect, that was not sort of the right message to send students. Yeah, we gotta be, we have to be um, realistic about their expectations. Um, mm -hmm. but we also have to inspire. And, and I, th I think the biggest mistake students make and young composers make and young musicians make that they don't have a realistic timeline, um, you know, with their career. Like they think, you know, some students think that, um, they'll be like making, you know, they'll be paying for the groceries, making rent just by scoring films in the, like in the first year, you know, oh, I mean, yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. It's like, no, that's not going to happen. And that there's nothing new about that. Like if you started your film scoring career 40 years ago, it would have still been the same thing. It was still hard then. There was still no money at first. And you have to um, give yourself a lot of time. Um, I've And and the thing is, the, the people who've, I, I wouldn't say failed, but who have maybe flamed, flamed out and have done other things, going, I'm going to nursing school now. I'm going to become a chiropractor. Like... Um, they just like I look, you know, because I've been I graduated Berkeley in 2000, you know, so more than 20 years ago. And when I take a look at some of the, my friends who are just like, you know, doing something else now, it's not because they weren't talented or they, they just had an, in my opinion, had an unrealistic timeline um, mm -hmm. of, of when they thought, you know, things were going to happen. And, and when, uh, conversely, um, when I think about like, you know the, the people that have, who have quote unquote made it, like from from my generation. So when I moved to LA in two thousand and three, you know I made friends and and looking at, you know we all started in the same place, having nothing, having no careers, no prospects, and then you mm -hmm. know seeing who has succeeded. Um, it has taken about fifteen years. You know, I mean, yeah. for, for people to kind of sort of break through. I think a good example is um, Pinar Toprak, who I don't know if you know who she is, but she's she's one of the more famous. She scored Captain Marvel. She scored the video game Fortnite, and I, I actually graduated with her, class of two thousand, from film scoring. And in two thousand and eighteen, she scored Captain Marvel, right, which made gross more than one billion dollars ac across the globe back when you could go out and go to movie theaters. Yeah, and um, and uh, 
you know, I, I think, you know, for her, people just thought she came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, boom, you know, this person they may not have ever heard of is now scoring Captain Marvel. When the reality of it is she has been working at it for 18 years, you know, mm -hmm. for 17 years, scoring films, scoring stuff that no one, nobody saw, you know, scoring. So, so, um, you know, but I, I think, uh, and that's hard. That's a hard message to get to get out to students who are maybe 20 years old, right? Because, because that's if you're saying, you know, you need to like give this like 15 years. I mean, that's 75 percent of their entire existence, right? And it's, right. So, um, but so I, I try to emphasize that as much as I I can because I I think that um, like one of my mentors, his, his name is Chris Young, and he. Um, he's a pretty well-known composer in LA. He scored Spider-Man three. I used to work for him. Um, but he was my teacher at first when I went to USC and he would always, when he was my teacher, he would say to our class, here's my cell phone number. If, if, you, if you leave LA, give me a call because I'm going to tackle you at the airport and I'm not going <laughs> to, and I'm not going to let you get on that airplane. You know, and so he he sort of and he so I, I guess I kind of learned this from him, but he um, he had been teaching in that program since the 90s and, and had, had seen a lot of people just kind of give up because it's hard, you know. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you do have to as an educator, I find that somewhat of a challenge to kind of, you know, be straight up with the students, you know, give them a dose of reality, but at the same time, inspire them, you know, because they're going to need that optimism uh, to, to yeah. succeed. I mean, I think that's when anyone asks me about Berkeley and, you know, should I go there and why did you go there and blah, blah, blah. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of rhetoric and a lot of haters and a lot of people who are, love it and blah, blah, blah. But I always tell people the thing that I got out of Berkeley that was extremely helpful was exactly what you were just describing. Berkeley does not sugarcoat the industry. We're well aware once you go to school there that you're getting into a very competitive cutthroat market, like marketplace as far as jobs and employment and everything. And it's all about persistence and it's all about like sticking to your guns and doing what you do really well. So that is what I got out of it. Um, yeah. You know, even going through the songwriting department and having classes with Pat and having Pat be like, hey, come with me to LA. I'm going out to the taxi conference. Why don't you come to the taxi conference? I'll introduce you to some like music supervisors, which that was an amazing experience. Just getting to meet some music supervisors and like give them my music and create relationships and all that. And like nothing came from that trip, but a few years later it did. I got paid to write music and I was like, okay, this is now this is going to happen. You know, now I'm going to start to do some stuff. And then another thing happened where I got called to do something. So it, it does, it does take time. And that was well after that, man. Like I, I was 29 maybe when I went with Pat to LA that one time, I didn't do these tunes until COVID. I got calls mm -hmm. from, um, you know, MPT, uh, they were launching a new show and they want, they wanted music for it. And they were like, we got your name. We want you to put in a bid, like write some music and we're going to pick the best one. And they chose mine. And then it just, happen and the only reason i feel like that happens because i already had classes that taught me what you're supposed to do with these people how you're supposed to work with them how quickly your turnaround should be like how approachable you are as a human being how easy you are to work with all oh, that's a cocktail that's shaken up yeah. and spilled out on the table basically and, and that's what i got out of it you know um and it's paid off so it's just you know how you approach it yeah and absolutely and, and i tell students all, all the time to and again, this is something that's sort of challenging because I'm trying to send the right message to them, which is, you know, this very nuanced thing. Um, but be open to all possibilities, be open to all opportunities. And so, like, in other words, listen to the marketplace, right? Because maybe the marketplace will tell you where you ought to go. I think it's a good thing to have goals to be sort of the, the great thing about goals. I think the important thing is not is not if you reach them or not, but but that they they create this catalyst, they create this forward motion for you to 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 get off your butt and start taking action, start moving. Because I think as long as you're moving, you'll you'll be okay. So for, for example, you know, I moved to <clears throat> I moved to LA, like every, like many others, to become the next John Williams 
and uh, and and like winning the next Academy Award. And I was going to be high fiving Hans Zimmer on my way to the stage to be collecting my <laughs> award. Nice, I love it. That didn't happen. Still hasn't happened. Um, and and so you know, I I wanted to compose, and I did compose, but I started to get a um, effortlessly sort of offers to orchestrate for other composers. So with with Chris Young, who I mentioned, he he um, you know an, an orchestrator for those who who don't know, um, the composer writes in a computer, but to get it from the computer onto the stand stands of like a hundred musicians takes a human brain. It, it takes a, a labor from a human being. There's no, unlike how, you know, some, some producers will say, what, there's no button for that. You can't just hit a button. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, no, there's no button right now. There's no magic button you can hit in the computer. That's just going to like create like music for an orchestra that, that is comprehensible and that, that works. So you still need a human, a human being to interpret these, this computer data and, 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 and who can, Oh, sorry. That's okay. um, to interpret this computer data and then put it on the stands. Um, so that's what an orchestrator is. So, so I started doing that for Chris and then that led to like some other work. I, uh, orchestrated for a composer named John Ottman, who, uh, he's a pretty well-known composer. He scored the X-Men movies. Uh, I, I worked for him on a movie called, uh, fantastic four rise of the silver surfer, um, another one called The Invasion with Nicole Kidman. Um, anyway, so I started to get work as an orchestrator and kind of be known known for that. Uh, but then sort of re relatively early on in my career, I had to make a decision. You know, do I want to be kind of a poor, or at least I felt I had to make a decision, you know, when I was in my 20s. Like, do I want to be a sort of poor struggling composer or a moderately successful orchestrator? Because I really loved orchestrating, even though I wasn't the one writing the music, I was still finding musical solutions to problems. I was still, and and by definition, that means your work will be performed and recorded with an orchestra, which is something that I lived for, you know. And and I look back on those days in my twenties, living in in LA, it was a very sort of privileged thing to have, where every few months I was recording with an orchestra. Uh, and and learning, like learning on the job, like and I would learn things like, oh, I didn't put enough violins on the tune that time. Next time I'm gonna, you know, do that. And it, it was a great way to learn how to write for an orchestra. Um, but you know, I sort of had a kind of, I, I didn't have unlimited resources or what. And what I mean by that is unlimited time. I couldn't pursue both at the same time, and so I kind of had to choose. And and I. I don't have any any regrets, you know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe if I stuck with the composing, I, I would be high fiving Hans Zimmer on my way to the stage, uh, <laughs> getting my Oscar. Who knows? Um, I guess we'll never. It's know. not too late. Uh, yeah, it's not too late, right? I'm still, you no. know, what I tell students too. Oh, but back mm -hmm. to the the time horizon thing, giving yourself a long time horizon. I'll ask students, how old was John Williams when he scored uh, when he scored the first Star Wars? Right, that was in Wasn't 1977. Wasn't he in his forties or something? Like he was forty. He was forty-five. Yeah. See, you so, you're well below so, that. So that that gives I don't know about don't know about, don't know about well below, but that gives that still gives us time to score the next yeah. Star Wars before John Williams scored his first Star Wars. I love Star stories Wars. like that. Yeah, I love so, it. So so and and that kind of blows our mind because some of them are like twenty, right? So that's more than twice how how old they are, and and so so for me, you know, just going back to my other story about sort of listening to the marketplace and in being open to other opportunities, you know, I sort of embraced the orchestration thing. It's 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 not what I moved to LA for, but I was making a living, and I couldn't believe it. Like on some of the projects, you know, they, they, the the pay varied, but I couldn't believe how much money I was making to do this thing that I really enjoyed. You know, mm -hmm. like it was really. Um, oh, sorry about all these alerts going off. Um, so I, I just I just I couldn't believe it. And and then sort of I can continue the analogy sort of to my current role now as, as an educator. Like I in 2009, I got married and I ended up moving out of state. I, I ended up moving to Minnesota from 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 the sunny climes of Santa Monica, California. And <laughs> and uh, uh, so. So, so the thing is, I luckily I was able to continue my um, my work as an orchestrator through the relationships I had. That really didn't affect that work too much. But um, but I knew that I couldn't just rely on that. Eventually, it would dwindle. Like I I was there's no way for me to make new connections 
in Minnesota. Um, so, so then, um, my fiance at the time, um, said, you know, there's this, um, there's this, um, uh, you know, music school and, um, you know, why don't, why don't you contact and contact someone there? So luckily I, I got there at a time where they're hiring. I didn't really even interview or anything like that. And, um, and, and so, so then I, I be, I started teaching at the college level, but on a part-time basis, but then sort of like, again, kind of effortlessly, I became full-time Then I become the department chair and then the assistant chair, um, the assistant chair position at Berkeley for the film scoring department um, became available in 2016. And so I just thought I would throw my hat in the ring and I really didn't expect to hear back, you know, fr from anybody. And then, and then, um, and so now I'm the chair of the department. And, and so again, that's like, I, I didn't, I didn't go to Berkeley in the first place to become the chair of the film scoring department. That was not on my radar. It was not part of the plan. Um, but, um, but I'm, you know, like, I think it's all worked out. No, I, again, again, I'm not high-fiving Hans Zimmer, but, um, but I, I think I'm able to, I think what we all want, um, and I know we're getting close to time here, um, is, is to, I mean, we're all motivated by different things, right? Um, yes, there are some, you, you can make millions of dollars in the music industry. That's possible. A lot of people have done it. I haven't done it, but a lot of people have done it. Um, some people dream of winning an Oscar, you know, and, and, and they take their, their hairbrush and they're giving their Oscar speech. And, um, but I, I think the one thing we all have in common, regardless of your other goals is we, we all want to do something meaningful. We, we want to mm -hmm. sort of have this meaningful existence. We want to produce art that, that has meaning. Um, and, and I think for me, I've been able to do that, um, through, through my, my job as, as a chair at, at of the of Berkeley's film scoring department. So um, I'm not writing a lot of music these days, frankly, but I am able to use my creativity and sort of channel it into my role. And um, I, I won't, kind of won't bore you with the, your audience with the details, but, you know, we've, we've been partnering with some software developers. You know, we're doing some stuff that's kind of unusual, if I can say, and, and creative um, in terms of the, the, the sort of film scoring education space. So, mm -hmm. so um so that I mean that that would be my my message to your viewers is just to you know whatever you do make sure you're just um, finding meaning in it, in your art you know yeah I think that's fair that's a good thing to end on and you know I I, I think you're making it, it must feel I used to be a teacher before I when I like before I went to Berkeley I was teaching in a high school teaching music and it really does there's days that are hard obviously as an educator. But then there are a lot of days where you see a light bulb go off on someone's above someone's head of a student and you're like, I helped that happen for that person. So they're going to take a small piece of any kind of wisdom that we can give them to make the world a better place. And that is pretty cool. Like, I, I feel like you must feel pretty, you know, it, it's full circle coming back to Berkeley. And, and there must have been a piece of that where you were like, this is pretty awesome. Like, you know just getting back here and like having a say in how we can sculpt the next generation. Yeah. Oh, it's very exciting. And I think it's an exciting time to be at Berkeley. I think it's an exciting time, an exciting time to be in film scoring and media scoring scoring. Uh, we just launched a video game scoring major and, and games will, uh, you know, it, it, they already have changed the world and they are going to change media. Uh, they're already changing movies, influencing movies. And, and so, there's a lot of opportunity right now and and it's it's really exciting so yeah it's, it's very um it's very much a privilege to be to be part of that and you know we both went to berkeley we had great teachers i'm sure you still remember you, know, you remember pat pattison mm -hmm. uh who, who's a legend i had pat pattison too nice. i've never for, i've never forgot i mean i still and i see now we're buddies right like yeah. I, we were high-fiving in the hallways but um but i mean yeah i mean to 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 sort of be remembered you know, like sort of one tenth of the, the the degree that Pat Pattison will be remembered, or to have like one tenth of the impact that someone like him has had on a whole generation. Yeah, I mean that that mm -hmm. that gets me very excited, and that's a very sort of you know privileged place to be. Yeah, I love that guy. He's so great. Yeah, he's so great. All yeah. right, you ready to do this lightning round? Get down. Let me get you out of okay, here. Okay, sure, sure. All right. So here's the deal. I'm going to ask you ten questions. 
you can, and we're going to put on 112 BPM flying altitude of 112 just for a little suspense, but I'm going to ask you no 10 pressure. questions. No pressure at all. Um, you can, you can explain your answers if you want to, or you can just burn through them, whatever you want to do. I love it either way. All right. Ready? Here we go. Okay. First question is always the same. Lennon or McCartney? That's tough. Um, Lennon. Okay. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Brass or woodwinds? Brass. Brass is just epic. Yes, it is. Especially with eight horns. Eight horns. Eight French horns. That's an awesome sound. Is that the John Williams sound? It's not the John Williams sound. It's it's the sort of over the top Hollywood sound. Uh, just so I'm going, I'm not going very quickly here. But the uh, if, if you know the Universal logo, you know when you see mm -hmm. a movie, you see the Universal. Dun, 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 dun. Da, 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 da. Anyway, that that's eight horns. It's it's just it's just like really, just really epic sound. I love it. Okay, I did not know that. Um, all right, here's here's the one for Boston and Minnesota. Boston winters or or Minnesota winters. Being from Toronto, oh, yeah, it's probably nothing to you, but oh, this no, this uh, Boston winters. I'd say, um, I, you know, I I moved for here from Minneapolis. I still keep the Minneapolis you know, weather icon on my phone. So I can, if it's like really cold and if it just sucks outside, uh, I feel better because I know it's at least 15 degrees colder in Minnesota. <laughs> you know, so. All right. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Yeah. Coffee all the way. All right. John Williams or Danny Elfman? John Williams. All right. What's the better score? These are both John Williams scores, but what do you like better? The Star Wars score or Harry Potter? Star Wars because it's more classic, but Harry Potter. There's a lot of virtuosic stuff oh happening, my God. you know, with the strings. Like, like so. That's a tough one. That might be the toughest one so far. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll say Star Wars. All right. Um, do you prefer if you're going to be scoring stuff? Do you like scoring towards? Because I've seen you had a bunch of horror stuff in your credits too. So, mm -hmm. like, would you prefer to be working on like a comedy or horror? Horror all the way. It's fun. Really? It's so much fun. Okay. Yeah, to scare people is, yeah. Get it's to be fun. creepy. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, 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 I'll, I'll, oh, sorry, I'll add one more thing. Scoring comedy is hard. I'm sure. It's hard to, because you have to understand, I mean, tra imagine trying to score like a British comedy. Like, I'm assuming you're American. Like, you don't, maybe not have watched, like, you have to have a certain sort of wit. You have to understand their humor and their jokes. And there's no way you're going to score that successfully. Unless you sort of understand, and I can tell you a lot of composers, they're afraid of comedy. They actually fear it because they know it's it's probably the hardest thing to score. Okay. Uh, horror, 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 horror movie, like thriller, horror, suspense, it's it's relatively easy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Finale or Sibelius? Sibelius. And actually, okay. if I can throw in another, there's a program called Dorico. I don't know who, if, how many... In your audience, you have who are interested in, in music notation, but that to me, Dorico's the future. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very bullish on, on Dorico. So, okay. All right. And then here's the last one, Sean. If you could take any soundtrack to any movie, okay, doesn't have to be your favorite one of all time, but if you could take one and erase it from your memory, like you've never heard it before, just so you could experience it for the first time again. Oh, what, Superman. What soundtrack? Okay, Superman. Superman. That's easy. Yeah. Man. yeah, no, no. Just to, to have that, to experience that for the first time, that'd be awesome. I might even pay yeah. for that. For that service. <laughs> well, you made it through. Congratulations. All right, thank you. Sean, dude, thank you so much for doing this. I know you're busy. And I, when we did the other thing, I was like, oh, my God, there's so much stuff I would want to talk to him about. Oh, well, I well really th appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. I hope it was of some value to your, uh, to your audience. And, uh, yeah, this was this was fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Everybody, um, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. We'll see you on the flip side.